I don't know really how to characterize the remnants of the Breitbart Empire. But an empire, I put in air quotes, although I actually am not physically doing the air quotes. Apparently, before Breitbart died or <laughs> maybe was taken out, he was planning to release a blockbuster video. This is actually sort of a funny story, not the part of him dying. But uh, he was going to release a blockbuster video along with the revamp site. The revamp site looks, you know, it's, it, it's, it's okay. The blockbuster video that he had been touting was to show Obama's radicalism when he was in law school. You know, Harvard Law School, incidentally, hotbed of radicalism. Hotbed. I mean, crazy. And apparently they had this video, which also uh, PBS had run in a documentary on him, I think, like four years ago. And it's a video. You should actually watch it because, well, it's very hard. Uh, Tommy Christopher on... Uh, on Twitter, just had tweeted, like, how does someone watch, how does a normal person watch that video and not come away more impressed with President Obama? And he gives a speech, and during the late 90s, uh, excuse me, the late 80s and the early 90s, and I'm aware of this only because for a couple of reasons. One, I went to BU Law School for a year uh, in 91. And I had a professor named Clark Bice, who was a contracts professor was actually uh, reportedly the character that Scott Turow or that, that, that show Paper Chase based the John Hausman character after this Clark Bice. And one of the stories I heard about Clark Bice at the time, who was this uh, old, very famous in legal circles, legal professor, contracts professor, was that during the late 80s in Harvard, in early 90s, there was a big struggle. Now, by struggle, we're talking about academics here, okay? Between the classicist, the classical legal thought, and those professors who advocated it, and critical legal studies professors. And these are two schools of legal thought. Critical legal studies, and experts can, can correct me on this, sort of was born out of uh, the critical realist movement, which was championed, I think, by a guy like Brandeis, who, who felt that the implications and the results of laws must be viewed in the process of adjudicating um, the constitutionality of a law or the, uh, the legitimacy of a law in the context. So in other words, when Brandeis went uh, before the Supreme Court uh, and pre uh, presented his famous Brandeis brief uh, about, um, about labor laws, about the implications to society about you know, uh, limiting, uh, you know, uh, child labor or 40-hour uh, work weeks and whatnot. Part of his reasoning was the implications for society and the value to society to not have children working, uh, to have a 40-hour work week, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, critical legal studies went even further, and critical race studies, which Professor Derek Bell uh, I don't know if he created that movement, was a big part of it, uh, go even farther. And they, uh, it's simply a way of uh, approaching the law. So it's fairly arcane stuff. And, uh, but during the late 90s, there was a war between the uh, classical sect at uh, Harvard Law and the critical legal studies sect. And there was a purge of the critical legal studies people. And
And in fact, I once heard a story, I think, about uh, Clark Bice that they were at a forum. Someone uh, invited uh, one of these critical legal studies professors, because this was all a fight about tenure, to come up and uh, talk about something. And Clark Bice basically went over to the guy and whispered, said, Don't, I wouldn't do this because they're trying to set you up. This is all part of sort of the, you know, fairly granular legal academia <laughs> um, uh, intrigue. But part of this struggle in the early 90s was, or an extension of it, or the last vestiges of it, Derek Bell uh, was insisting on more minority representation amongst the faculty and uh, at Harvard Law School. And uh, I think at this time, President Obama was head of the Harvard Law Review. And he spoke, and frankly, the speech is incredibly impressive. Uh, he, was, he was a great speaker then, too. It's sort of, I, my only uh, reaction actually was like, he hasn't gotten, he hasn't really improved. He was that good then. And at the end of the speech, uh, he is um, he's talking about how impressed he is with uh, Professor Bell, and I think Professor Bell gives him a hug. So this was the video that Breitbart had been sitting upon. And I guess uh, PBS and BuzzFeed came out with the video <laughs> before Breitbart's toadies could. And I guess the reason why they were holding it back is because they had a lot of editing to do. You know, you gotta, you gotta have that hug, you gotta repeat that hug like a bunch of times to make it even that much more nefarious. And it is, it is really sort of, it's creepy to follow uh, some of the Twitter feeds of some of these Breitbart cronies talking about how this video is so damaging to the president. We're finally vetting the president. He had appreciation for this Harvard Law professor. It is, it is beyond, these people have fallen so far down the wormhole. I mean, they're releasing this video. Just think about this juxtaposition. They're releasing this video or attempted to release the video or touting this video 36 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours after the Attorney General of the United States says that the President essentially has unilateral authority to assassinate a citizen based upon a secret tribunal that's not really even a tribunal. And they think the scandal that they're going to push is that the president of the Harvard Law Review hugged a Harvard Law professor or dean and that this is the thing that's going to bring the, the Obama administration to its knees. Alinsky, Ayers, Acorn. I, I wonder how they're going to frame this in that context by, by calling it A. A video of Obama hugging a professor. The, the, this is what is so problematic now about, you know, when you have a president who is doing something that as a... Uh, liberal, progressive, uh, you know, a civil libertarian uh, is, is so offensive. And a, an opposition movement that is moronic. Just moronic. And it's literally, I mean, I hesitate to use this analogy, but the, they're like worms eating off the corpse of this uh, site, let's put it this way. Where they're all like, we better get while well, the getting's good. We're not going to be able to make much more money off this stuff. So we're going to hype this video. And what, what, the next one's going to be like, Barack Obama went to a Sadie Hawkins dance and he asked the girl to go. I mean, the, the level of just delusion and insanity. And so it's just, it's just beyond the pale. And meanwhile, so Chris Hayes uh, tweets, 
like uh, that he's watched the video and he's sort of also amazed at how amazing of a speaker President Obama was at that time. And uh, I just tweeted back to him, well, you obviously, you, you, you clearly did not see how they photoshopped the teleprompters out of the video, which, of course, is the next step, right, for these people, right? That Obama actually wasn't even do, giving that speech. There was a guy with cue cards that you can't see in the video, whatever the insanity they have to come up with next. And so I think Hayes um, uh, retweeted it. And then I got so many uh, tweets back like, there was no teleprompter there, or you're right. <laughs> Because our, our, our political d debate in this country just, the, it's just become so infested and infected by the likes of the late Andrew Breitbart and his still living and breathing parasitic minions. It's just, it's just bizarre. And, and, and yet, you do not see these same people who are touting this video, talking about something that is a legitimate and real issue in which they could find, if they really wanted to attack the, the president, as opposed to continue to feed this cottage industry of in the insane and deluded audience that they have, if they genuinely wanted to stoke some type of opposition, here it is. And theoretically, this should be in their wheelhouse. Because if the Constitution means anything in its most basic form, one would think it would be that the president doesn't have the right to assassinate American citizens without a demonstrable due process process. But no. Uh, for them, it is all about the video that they, you know, who knows? <laughs>